it's particularly relevant given everything that's going on in the financial markets and on Wall Street. A year ago, I was at the Wharton School to do some recruiting for Google when in the Penn bookstore, I saw this book, The Mindful Leader, and it drew my attention because mindfulness as a practice is something that's important, but we associate with a monastery or an ashram. And leadership is something we think of in terms of the boardroom or organizations. So the juxtaposition of those two words caught my eye. And I devoured the book, as you can see from the, all the bookmarks and highlighting. And I asked the leadership team to invite uh, Michael to come and speak here. Now, Michael is very well suited to this topic. He spent over two decades on Wall Street and in the publishing industry. He worked for Shears and Lemon Brothers, Payne Weber, Walt Disney, and Simon Schuster. He's also spent 35 years meditating and is a meditation teacher. Not 35 years meditating. Maybe he'll talk about how he does that. But in the practice, uh, and he is a meditation teacher in the lineage of Tibetan meditation master Chogyam Trungpa. He also teaches on this topic of being a mindful leader at Wharton, Columbia, and many other institutions. What is going on currently is there is a new generation of business leaders looking towards mindfulness as a, <coughs> excuse me, as a practice to develop their leadership talent, a technique for learning to live in the present moment, and how individuals can gain clarity, reduce stress, optimize, optimize performance, and develop a greater sense of well-being. So in this talk, Michael will lead us through how mindfulness-based training can help us make, become better human beings, better leaders, and hopefully better Googlers as well. With that, please help me welcome Michael Carroll. Well, needless to say, thank you very much, Gopi, for, uh, for this, and Alana as well. Where's Alana? Is she here? There she is. Thank you very much for all this hard work and your invitation. <clears throat> I also want to thank uh, everyone here, you folks here with a little story. Just to, I was last night having my dinner uh, at a little bar in town somewhere, and I struck up a conversation with the fellow next to me. And he says, so what are you doing in town? And I said, well, I'm going to give a little lecture tomorrow. We had a little conversation at Google. you know." And he says to me, uh, oh, boy, I tell you, that little white box that those guys put on the computer is really great. Would you thank them for me? So I would like to thank you. I know behind the scenes you guys are doing a ton, but, but there's a lot of this out there that's just a little white box. And it's a fantastic thing that you guys have done. So I want to thank you all on behalf of the guy in the bar, myself, and probably and millions of other people for the, the great service that you have done in this um, emerging society. So thank you very much. <clears throat> so we have a short time together. And uh, what I'd like to do is... Uh, really go over just a few points, not too many, about what distinguishes uh, this approach to leadership. Uh, I, would th I will then, I'm going to give you meditation instruction in this particular style of meditation. And then if there's some time, well, there will be time, to discuss the practice, have some Q&A, and also, if you'd like, I could say a few words about where this is being applied uh, quite rigorously in like the practice of law, for example, uh, in the classroom, in medicine. So that would be the kind of the, the agenda, so to speak. Before I do this, though, I do want to say one other thing, is this approach to leadership is not some form of chauvinism, where like I'm sitting up here telling you guys, I got this, the idea, this is it, this kind of training is the answer. In fact, all of us here know this, but we have access to great leadership training. Um, many great institutions like Wharton, uh, even the military, and uh, even what Alana's doing in terms of creating these kinds of internal, almost like universities for people. So what I'm proposing here today isn't sort of the answer. It's just uh, an aspect that I think we want to pay attention to if we want to be as um, inspiring as maybe our uh, as much as we'd like to be. So with that said, I'd like to get into a couple points. The first one will be <clears throat> a little story. 
I was working with a, a doctor who runs a clinical research organization. He had hired me to do some uh, work with him. And my very first meeting with him, he was very straightforward. And he said to me, you know, leadership is very simple for me. It's getting from point A to point B as quickly and as efficiently and as profitably as possible. Very simple. And I said, well, you know, I, I agree that to a great degree what we're trying to do in business is get from point A to point B as efficiently and as quickly as possible. But there is one important difference that distinguishes this approach from that, which is we all want to get from point A to point B as quickly and as efficiently as possible. But in this case, we also want to arrive at point B with our collective sanity intact. What we're finding in organizational settings is we're all working very hard. I watched all your colleagues here, and I'm sure it's true for everyone. The, the, the technology is driving us in a very passionate way. And we have objectives to achieve, but way too often when we get there, we're burnt out. Uh, we haven't spent enough time with our family. Our customers are angry. Our vendors are dissatisfied. Uh, we're not getting along with our boss, or we have some cranky thing with our client, with our colleagues. So one of the first distinguishing features of this approach to leadership is that we cannot define success as simply achieving our objectives. There is more to being a successful leader, and it has to do with not neglecting our world along the way. That we often find ourselves rushing to get to point B, and we've neglected our world. We've neglected our lives in many respects. So mindful leadership is about, in a very real way, as we go from point A to point B, with all the ambition and passion and fun and I can tell you guys have a lot of fun here doing what you do, is that we can actually, along the way, create a sane world. That we can inspire the best in one another. We don't need to leave a mess. Has anyone noticed a mess recently, anywhere? <laughs> so, <clears throat> so that's the first aspect of mindful leadership is that as we, with all of our ambition, we need not neglect our world. We can attend to our world in, with dignity and decency. And we can actually inspire the best in one another. You know, often leadership is about achieving objectives. We forget that great leaders inspire the best in people. Uh, so, there was a gentleman here by the name of Gandhi and when he came up and he said his name Gandhi, I was like, wow. Just even hearing the name, I'm inspired. That it brings the best out of me. And that's a critical part of leadership, and it's a critical part of mindful leadership. So the second, the second uh, distinguishing thing I'd like to bring to your attention about mindful leadership is let's look a little closer, even closer at this getting from point A to point B. And in examining it, if we look carefully at how we apply effort in our lives, uh, typically we apply effort uh, in trying to achieve things. And for many people here, you know, you're, it's amazing speaking to you, I oh, PhD in that, PhD in that, MBA here very uh, intelligent people who have been very, very well trained in many respects. And if you go back to when this all started, and I'll speak for myself, I know it was a very diverse group, but I'll speak for, for myself. You know, when it started in, in grade school, when I was in sixth grade, I, I wanted to be in eighth grade. I didn't want to be in, in eighth grade. I didn't really want to be in sixth grade because all the cool people were eighth graders. So you get to eighth grade, and as soon as you get to eighth grade, where do you want to be? You want to be in high school, because all the cool people are in high school. So you're a freshman in high school, and where do you want to be? You want to be a senior, because all the cool people are a senior. Become a senior, where do you want to be? You want to be in college, because being in... You get in college, where do you want to be? 
You don't want to get out, get a job, you get promoted, you get promoted. So if we look at the, 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 the quality of how we apply our effort, generally speaking, we're always trying to get somewhere. We're always trying to get somewhere. Even going on vacation, we go, okay, I'm going to go on vacation, and I can't wait, it's going to happen to you. We, we get on vacation, and then we go somewhere, and then we, we got to come home. You know? Then we got to go back again. There's a great commercial uh, of this uh, guy renting a car. And it's a normal commercial, but the interesting thing about it is you never see the guy in the commercial. All you see is a blur. And he blurs past the person who fills out the form and her hair goes like this. And he blurs into the car. And he, it's a whole blur until at the very end of the commercial. He comes up and the blur stops and he has his golf clubs on. And it says, National Car Rental, faster than the speed of life. Right? So he's trying to get to his, his vacation. And you know what happens when he gets on the golf course, right? Oh, well, come on, hurry up. You know, rushing, who's that guy up there? Get off the green. So when we examine this effort, we're not only trying to get somewhere, we're trying to get there fast. We're trying to be smarter, faster, quicker. And there's a sense of speed and intensity. Even just hailing a bus or waiting in line. You know, I'm in New York. I've lived in New York for 25 years. I don't live there anymore, but... In New York, as you're waiting in line to buy some gum, if the person in front of you takes you know, about 4.3 seconds too long, it's, oh, what's going on? So there's this effort of always trying to get somewhere and get there fast. And then the final part of this, which, which, which makes it even more intriguing, is we're trying to get somewhere fast, and when we arrive there, we want to be someone else. We want to be skinnier. We want to be smarter. We want to be richer. We want to be more loved. We want to be more successful. There's a great study done by Yankelevich, which is a consumer research company. Number one, I guess it's number one. Maybe some people here work with them. And they, they, they um, examine uh, the, the patterns, our patterns of buying as Americans. And one of their findings was that eight out of 10 Americans, when we buy stuff, we inhabit alternative realities. Now, obviously, the first question is, what does that mean, In, inhabit alternative realities? What they found was, that when we uh, go shopping for stuff, we tend to pretend we're someone else. And in the great tradition of capitalism, they, they tried to isolate the top 10 things we pretend to be so we could sell to those illusions, but that's not what I'm here about. That when we purchase things, we pretend that we're movie stars, rock stars, wealthy, successful people, uh, athletes, uh, that we actually pretend to be other people. Eight out of ten of the purchases. And uh, I love this fact, which I love doing in New York City. It may hit you guys as, as well. The number one thing that Americans pretend they are when we buy stuff is a cowboy. <laughs> and when you say that to New Yorkers, they all go, and that means that they, once again, they forgot that on the other side of the Hudson, is this huge thing called America. It's huge out there. So <clears throat> when we examine effort, our, our everyday conventional application of effort, we're always trying to get somewhere. We're trying to get there fast. And when we arrive there, we want to be someone else. Now, this, by definition, is not a bad thing. You take a young person who wants to be a doctor, and she works very hard, goes to school and gets an MD and becomes someone else who's skilled, compassionate, capable. So it's not that there's a problem per se about this ambition and this effort. 
There is a problem, however, because for, to a great degree in our society and to a great degree in organizations, there's a profound blind spot with this effort. And the blind spot is that in the effort of always trying to get somewhere, we overlook how to simply be somewhere. Simply be somewhere. Very simple. And in the effort of trying to become someone else, someone skinnier, richer, more successful, we overlook how to simply be who we are. Just to be who we are. To be who we are, where we are, completely. And in this approach to leadership, of mindful leadership, this ease of being who we are, where we are, is the fundamental gesture of a leader. To be comfortable right here in our own skin. To be at our ease. <clears throat> Which brings us to the third kind of distinguishing feature here which is leadership training is typically about a wide variety of things. Uh, gaining more competencies, for example. How to weave together strategy, tactics, operations, infrastructure. How do you do that? The competencies required. Or it could be about having access to more sophisticated and complex information so as to make better decisions. Al Alana was showing me that very cool kind of grid you have down there where you can map things on a XY, you know, the number of births versus, you know, dollars spent on bananas or whatever, and you can just watch the world move. It's a beautiful thing. And I do hope you make that available to, to many people. But again, Leadership could be about how do you access this information? How do you use this information to make better decisions, to impact and, and contribute to the world? Uh, or it could be about developing um, a view. How do you develop a different view? Uh, which I think you guys do very well here, actually. You play with view a lot. Look at it this way, look at it that way. And it's all fantastic and important. But what mindful uh, leadership is about is not so much about more competencies or, or using information differently. It's about training your minds. There's one tool. You all have lots of tools. Uh, a lot of hardware tools, a lot of software tools. And as engineers, you know about this. But there's one tool that everybody brings to this proposition which is our mind. And to a great degree, with all due respect, I think we take it for granted. You, know, you wake up in the morning, you look in the, in the, you look in the uh, uh, mirror and you have your toothbrush, and you're saying to yourself, oh, I gotta do this thing today. Oh, I, gotta, I gotta get shoelaces for my shoes. And we've all, to a great degree, I'll speak for myself, I came to the conclusion for a long time that my mind was this voice inside my head. We're all familiar with your voice inside your head? Uh, that's your mind, right? Yeah. But maybe it's not. Maybe this experience that we're having here uh, is, uh, uh, it has off, uh, offers us more than, than maybe meets the eye. And there's a tool that we bring to it, which is our minds. Uh, and often, we don't train our minds. We give more information, we give more competencies, we create different views, different experiences, but we literally don't train the tool that we bring to the proposition. Mindful leadership is about actually training our minds in a very specific way, <clears throat> which is this practice of mindfulness meditation. How many people here uh, do mindfulness meditation? <laughs> Great. There's, a, there's about a dozen people. But I, I, I always give that. You know, yeah, I kind of get to the cushion sometimes, and then I don't, which is part of the challenge, frankly. It's practicing, you know, getting to the cushion. 
So for those who practice mindfulness, what we'll go through here will be familiar. And for those who haven't, uh, hopefully you'll find this helpful. What I'd like to do is uh, give you the mindfulness instruction, and then we'll, we'll, do the, we'll do the practice for a little bit. Uh, maybe a couple hours. Is that okay with everybody? Oh, yeah. Uh, just for maybe five minutes or so. And then we could have some discussion about the experience of this practice. Uh, and I see there's a um, microphone here, so we can have some Q&A. And if there is some more time, I can talk about how mindfulness is being applied in a variety of settings. Uh, at Harvard, for example, they have an annual conference on the application of mindfulness to the practice of law and how attorneys are using this discipline in how they uh, conduct themselves as attorneys and others. So but if there's some time, I can speak about that. But what we'll do now is I'd like to give you the, the meditation instruction. We'll sit for a little bit, and then we can have some discussion about your experience. Okay? All right. So <clears throat> the instructions I'm going to give you now are in a discipline that is called mindfulness awareness. And uh, this practice originated in India about 2,600 years ago or so as an expression of the yogic uh, tradition. There was a particular gentleman who was doing yoga at the time by the name of Siddhartha, and he uh, did this uh, very fundamental, what's called asana, and uh, had some kind of historic experience uh, that has been passed on uh, for centuries. And uh, this particular instruction was given to me by uh, Tibetan teachers. And uh, I have been fortunate uh, enough to have practiced this for quite some time. Not so well. I'm a very well-trained student, but not a very good student. Uh, so I was given this instruction and have been trained to teach this to others. So it does come from a, um, a Tibetan lineage. Uh, the practice is very is practiced throughout Asia. There's, you know, you might be familiar with Zen. You know, Zen Buddhism is very uh, robust here in San Francisco, so it's similar. So, with that said, we'll do the meditation. So, the first thing is posture, and you're sitting in chairs that honestly are not the best for this. Okay which is fine, since it's a brief session, uh, we, we don't have to worry about that. Uh, typically, what you would do is you would, have, you would sit up straight, not leaning on the back of the chair. And uh, the idea is to sit up straight with your feet flat on the ground, first off. However, because the chairs are not the best, uh, the, the key when you're doing this meditation, not the key, one of the keys to doing this meditation, is that the crease of your hip is higher than your knee. When, you're, when your knee is higher than the crease of your hip, you can't sit up straight. You're going to be struggling. Uh, and these chairs push you back, so it doesn't incline in that way. So rather than flat on, if you'd like to cross your feet a little bit, uh, but just get your knees below the crease in your, your hip. You can kick them back or whatever. So that's the first thing. Very simple, and you'll notice by doing that, it's pretty easy to sit up straight. There's no struggle to sitting up straight. So we sit up straight, and the hands are placed very simply, flat on the thighs or the knees. There's a reason for this. I won't go into it since we have a short period of time together, uh, but the hands very simply on the knees. The next is there's... Uh, normally we have a little crease in our neck here. Uh, and what we do here is we just tuck the chin in slightly. Not a lot, just a very little, so as to straighten the neck. The mouth is loose. It's not gritted like this, just loose. And the eyes are open. The quality of the eyes is a soft gaze, a gentle gaze. It's not focusing on anything in particular. Uh, there's a quality of general vividness. So we'll sit like this for a moment. Thank you. 
Okay. Now, as you're sitting here, you may notice that there's two things going on. The first one is a very simple and vivid direct experience of our senses. Very simple, very direct. I'm just sitting here, and you can hear our neighbor cough. One of our neighbors apparently dropped their computer on the ground, and we heard it tumble. And something fell. You can hear the slight movement of the air in the conduits, the colors. Very simple, very direct, vivid, unadorned experience of our senses. Now, the second thing you may notice that's going on is that you're talking to yourself. There's a commentary going on inside our heads, and it could be anything. It could be meandering, like la 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 la. It could be panicky, oh my god, how do I get out of here? Uh, it could be busy, oh my god, I could be doing this, I could be doing that, where's my scrambled eggs, whatever, whatever. whatever. But there is an internal dialogue going on. Now, there's no problem with either of these experiences. In fact, this is exactly what we work with when we train our minds with this discipline. And the way we work with these two experiences are, work with, is, uh, is uh, as you're sitting here, and you notice that you're thinking, as soon as you notice that you're thinking, you label it thinking. You actually acknowledge, recognize that you're thinking. You say to yourself, oh, thinking. And then you bring your attention to your breath. And you place your uh, attention on your breath very gently. It's like, uh, like petting a kitty. Very gently. Attend to your breath. And then, sure enough, you'll start thinking. And as soon as you notice that you're thinking, you label it thinking and bring your attention to your breath. Okay? So we'll do this now for just a few moments, and we'll, I brought my only prop along with me, which is my bell. And I will, uh, we'll begin and end this uh, short session with a bell. Okay?
So do you have any uh, questions about the instruction or observations about your experience? Yes? I must have told myself to focus on my breathing about a million times. Right. So one of the first things that you experienced was thinking, thinking, thinking. OK. <laughs> You're smiling, though. Why are you smiling? Right. So one of the first observations that we had, what is your name? ML. ML, thank you. One of the first observations that ML is making here is that when we actually take time to look at our minds, it's amazing how little control we have over what we're thinking. Where, how sleep you brought, Diane. I noticed. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But, you know, it's funny, particularly for new practitioners, you might find, uh, it's true for people who practice all that, but for new practitioners, it can be quite a challenge, is often we find ourselves like this. <laughs> you know, and one would think, in this case, with you, Gopi, it could be that you were sleepy, but one would think typically, oh, well, if you sit here long, you get tired. I mean, But if you really look carefully, what happens when we get sleepy in, in the practice uh, is that for the very first time, we've actually touched our speedy mind, and it's exhausting. It is tiring to constantly go, well, what are you going to do next? Why am I doing this? What, think, what, <laughs> It's exhausting. Tremendous amount of energy going on there. Any other uh, questions about the instruction? Or Yeah. Me? Yes, yes. I've, I've got trouble controlling my thoughts as well, and I'm wondering if you have any suggestion of what we should concentrate on, maybe a color or an image or something that would yeah. put us at ease. Even one thing when we're inhaling and a different thing when we're exhaling. Yeah. Even just two things I can think about, please. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, here again, we go back to this idea of effort, right? And, and <clears throat> the effort you're trying to apply here is the effort of getting somewhere. So you, you're saying, could you, could you give me something to make this easier? Because I don't want to be where I am. I, I don't want to have the mind that I have. I want to have this other mind. And there's an old Tibetan saying, if you want to tame a bull, you don't put ropes around it and put it in a corral. You let it out in a big field. Let it run around. Eventually, it gets tired and falls asleep. So we're not applying this effort of trying to get somewhere. We're not trying to get somewhere where we control our thoughts. Who did that the other night? I don't know if you saw the debate. Anyway, uh, we're not trying to control our thoughts. We're actually developing the muscle of just being. Just being. And what, what's the, one of the very, you know, m this practice teaches many things. What is your name, my friend? Anuity. Anuity. Uh, this practice teaches many things. But one of the very first things it teaches is how profoundly out of touch we are with just being here. Just being here. So we're not trying to control our thoughts or think less. The instruction is very specific. As soon as you notice your thinking, bring your attention to your breath. Keep your attention on the breath. And uh, you may notice that this is a tremendously boring thing to do for long periods of time. That boredom is actually very, very healthy. It's very healthy. Go ahead, my friend. Yeah. Um, wouldn't this practice over time take away our ambition to achieve? Uh, it has with me. I become a jellyfish with this. It's a terrible thing to know. Uh, the question was, uh, w this practice, w you know, if you do this long enough, doesn't it take away our, our, our passion to, to achieve and to, to our ambition in a certain sense? Uh, and I, I actually would say quite the opposite. What I've found in my corporate life is our natural desire to contribute to the world, to make great things, to succeed, to become better at what we do, we typically get tripped up along the way because we're not paying attention to our world. So what this is about is passion is great, ambition is fantastic, but if you, if you want to get from point A to point B, I, I'll put it this way. You know, on Wall Street, one of the 
back in the old days, you know, it was a very macho guy thing to say. Look, if you don't have really clear goals, if you don't know where you're going, my friend, you're going to get lost. You know, big, you know, tough guys, you know. Well, over time, I, I learned this, that you may know where you're going with all your ambition and power and interest and passion, but if you don't know where you are, that's the definition of being lost. Because you could say, I'm going to New York right now. Oh, that's great. Do you know where you are? No, I don't, actually. You're lost. You can't get to New York from there. So what we're talking about is ambition must be grounded in a very realistic appreciation of our world uh, so that we don't end up tripping over ourselves, so to speak. OK? Uh, when you get bored, that is after five minutes, 10 minutes, the board of mm -hmm. Now, when do you stop? Mm -hmm. when you yeah. Well, there's, there's two types of boredom. Repeat question. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I understand. For the, for the YouTube, too. I mean, it's a, um, there's two types of, he asks about boredom. You know, and when, when the boredom, you know, five minutes, ten minutes, et cetera, et cetera, when do you stop? Well, I think, first off, there's two types of boredom to pay attention to. There's the hot boredom. Hot boredom's like this. I'm going to get out of here. I can't. What's going on? When's this guy going to ring the bell? Oh, man. That's hot boredom. Hot boredom is particularly in the beginning of the practice, but it's with us throughout the entire journey, so to speak, um, is something that we work with and we gently tame over time. There's another form of boredom which is called cool boredom. It's like being a rock in the ocean. When the ocean and the water hits it, you know? The rock never sits there and goes, okay, when's, uh, when's this rock thing over? You know, when's this ocean thing going to end? It's, it's an ease of being. So this boredom at first may appear to be an intrusion or a waste of time or, or whatever, but it's really the beginning, if you think of it as a gym, we're in a spiritual gym here, you're actually exercising your muscle of being. And we haven't used it very much. So it's like you do a couple of push-ups and you're like, oh man. But once you get strong with this boredom, it's, it's, it's an ease of being. You can just sit here. It's very powerful. Very powerful. So that means it gets transformed into something. It, it, doesn't, it transforms not a bad word, but it really rests. We eventually rest. And you'll notice if you sit here for some time, the things that begin to come up are quite powerful. You know, now, one of the things about leadership, you know what it's like to work with leaders who don't respect you. Yeah, get it done. Let's go. Come on. Come on. That energy, you, you all know it. It may not be as dominant in your culture. It doesn't feel toxic, at least intuitively, when I'm here. But I do come from Wall Street. I know what it looks like. Um, that toxicity of disrespectfulness from a leader is very demeaning, uh, and, it, and it creates an atmosphere really of mediocrity and failure, ultimately. Now, when we sit meditation, and you sit here, and if you sit here long enough, if you're going to do this journey, eventually you're going to sit here for a long time. You don't have to at first, just a little short periods, and I'll give some advice at the end of this. But eventually, you're going to sit here for a long time. And you're going to have to get to know your mind. All our fears and hopes, the fact that we don't like our curly hair, uh, the fact that my girlfriend left me and never called me ever again, and my heart's broken, whatever it is, we're going to have to get to know that. And the only way to get to know it is with some sense of gentleness, to be kind to ourselves. This kindness toward ourselves of just sitting here and permitting ourselves to get to know our minds and hearts unfolds into everyday life as respect toward others. Very simple. It is very hard to be a practitioner of this discipline and to be disrespectful to people. It's very hard to do. I have yet to meet anybody who's tried to pull that off. Because it's natural. It's a natural leadership talent that we have to treat one another with respect 
And it begins with respecting our own minds, not taking them for granted. So if you're really bored and you want to do this practice, uh, my teacher would say, you should practice more. <laughs> Just keep sitting. OK? Sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. rather than being able to read there before it turns into something concrete, being able to identify it as thinking. Uh, right. What is your name? Effie. Effie? You know, everybody has really cool names here. I'll tell Everybody has really cool names here. It's a neat name, Effie. So what Effie was saying was, is, you know, what I, I, I found in the practice was actually observing my thoughts they began to sort of take form, and I became curious about where they were going to go uh, and how to work with that. Is that fair? Right. Well, you know, in the practice, there's kind of two different styles. Or not styles, there's two aspects. One is precision, and the other is space. Precision, and in the Zen tradition, you could actually sit here, and there are instructions where you can actually be so precise that you can recognize a thought as it arises and clip it. Just, and it takes a tremendous amount of discipline, just a, not, a, not even a thought. The other style is lots of space. You just let whatever come up and arise and fall at will. And, and finding the ground, the, your own style, it sounds to me like you're, you're more precise in that way. Uh, and I would say, you know, maybe open up. Let the thought go and just come back to your breath a little more gently. But we all have our own way of working with the technique up front. But the key is, and what we're really working with here, is we're exercising a muscle of coming back. Just coming back to the present moment. So that when you're off the cushion and you're sitting in the room with your friends and your colleagues over here working, you're not just on your agenda. Oh, he's got to get this other thing. You actually come back and you go, oh, there's Effie. It's a great shirt you have on with the flowers, and you have a beautiful smile. And we appreciate one another because we've trained our mind to come back. So, however, you get back, just come back. <laughs> okay. Yes? Do we have to sit here to do the meditation? Can we lie down? The question is do we have to sit here to do the meditation? Can we lay down? Yeah, they're very, this is, you know, why do you want to lay down and do this? It's more relaxing, you see? That's the effort of trying to get somewhere, not be somewhere. And we can get very, this is very suspicious. We can, I'm very suspicious of my mind because it's always trying to kid itself. You know, it's like, can I do this? Can I do this laying down? Can I do this while I'm drinking a milkshake? <laughs> Can I do this while I'm drinking a milkshake watching television? <laughs> right? So, believe it or not, this asana, this yogic posture, is enormously skillful. In the West, we tend to go, well, what's the difference? I mean, you put your hands like this, you put your hands like this. You, what, what? No, no, no. These postures and asanas and mudras hand, uh, are very, very subtle and very powerful. They don't appear that way, but they are. So the instruction is uh, the sitting meditation is the fundamental uh, gesture of a mindful leader. Sitting down in this way and doing this. From that comes a lot of mindfulness practices, like walking meditation, flower arrangement. Uh, you, can be, you can begin to do mindful tennis if you'd like. But you first must make this core gesture of sitting down and doing this technique. Okay? Yes? Beyond your uh, book, do you have any other suggested readings for people to start going? Yeah. Um, uh, there's a, uh, since we're on YouTube, my publisher would be very upset if I didn't say, there's a second book that I have, <laughs> which is uh, called Awake at Work which is actually a, a technique for bringing this practice literally onto the job. So I would recommend that. But there's a lot of really good, uh, you know, 
If you're interested in uh, bringing this discipline into the workplace, I would say there's not a lot of written about it. You know, and, and fortunately, I'm one of the people who have written some stuff on it. If you're I interested in um, meditation per se, then I would encourage you to read Pema Chodron. Do you, anyone ever hear of Pema Chodron? Pema Chodron is a, a, a Tibet, uh, she's an American nun in, in my lineage. She's written, I guess the book that I would encourage is uh, um, Start Where You Are, or which one were you going to say? When Things Fall Apart. When Things Fall Apart. It's a g great book. Uh, if you want to get into the really great instruction on, on meditation, The Path is a Goal. The Path is the Goal. That's a great book. Okay. You can email me if you'd like at awakeatwork.net and I'll be glad to give you any guidance that you'd like. Yes. Yep. Well, no, it's not the wrong way. Not, not, but what we're talking about here is, is in yoga, what is your name? Pam. Pam was saying, you know, in yoga, I, I like yoga because it, I can see results, I've got objectives, I can achieve things. I can, it, it's, it, it's harder here. Uh, this is more difficult for her. But you're hitting the proverbial nail right on the head. Okay? We're not, this practice is not about doing something easier, faster, quicker, or anything like that at all. This is a different muscle altogether we're developing. In the, in the profound aspect of this, Pam, is that we're not saying that we need to become someone else. This practice, if you do it, is actually acknowledging that there's something already going on about our humanity that is profound that we don't need to do anything else. We just need to rest in our natural state. And in so doing, we discover that we are confident, at our ease, brave, kind, respectful beings. And that can have a tremendously positive impact in organizations. That's not to say that you shouldn't do yoga. I should do yoga, for God's sakes. Look at me, I should lose a few pounds. But uh, that's not the point to this practice. Uh, and there are many yoga studios that combine this ability to just be with the practice of yoga, and that, that can actually be helpful as well. But uh, this is not a substitute or an either-or, okay? Hi, I'm using the microphone because I'm such a good boy. Yeah, so, <laughs> so Michael doesn't have to repeat the questions. Uh, I just want to uh, comment on the previous question, I think it was from this gentleman, about uh, doing this practice at work. So we have a course in Google called uh, Search Inside Yourself, which is using mindfulness practice as a vehicle for developing emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. which, which can use at work. Mm -hmm. So for those who are interested, uh, just search for Search Inside Yourself in the Internal MoMA Network. Great. Well, that's, it's fantastic. You know, this emotional intelligence issue, uh, a lot of work is being done in uh, the practice of law. And uh, if you go online and look up uh, Patton Hyman. He is a practicing attorney who's written on this in the Vermont Law Journal, or uh, Leonard Riskin, who's written in the Harvard uh, Negotiating uh, Law Review. Uh, essentially, what they've found about this emotional intelligence issue is uh, attorneys find themselves trapped in adversarial mindsets. There's always a desire to maximize their client's position, even to the unreasonable disadvantage of their opponent. And if any of you, and I work with attorneys a lot in employee, employee law, if you ever get a letter from an attorney, it's always fraught with hyperbole and over-exaggeration. You know, you stubbed your toe. But now I, I, it's my whole family, you can't work, you need to pay me millions of dollars. It's always this overly energized aggression, adversarial mindsets which creates a tremendous amount of suffering for everybody. What they've found is that attorneys who, are, who practice this discipline 
are not trapped by those mindsets and can be far more skillful emotionally in these circumstances uh, in terms of being able to not be impressed with toxic emotions and be able to negotiate more effectively. So uh, I applaud the fact that you guys do this discipline here and it can have a very direct impact on uh, the sanity of our emotions, that they don't have to be... Uh, we don't need to be afraid. We don't need to be angry. We don't need to be toxic. We can be sane and kind. So, good. Closing thoughts? Yeah. Closing thoughts. Um, well, you know, it's uh, one final remark. You know, when I started practicing meditation, uh, I started practicing in 75, 76, and I started working on Wall Street in the 80s, early 80s. And to practice mindfulness meditation, on Wall Street in the early 80s, you would never let anyone know that because you would be viewed as not part of the adult world. You would be some kind of uh, flake. Uh, so we used to keep it to ourselves and uh, you not know, say much about it. It was fine. But now it's so interesting how this practice has become mainstream. And, you know, I find myself now in my 50s teaching at a, one of the great leading organizations of the world. Uh, with, you know, large attendance. Uh, so I'm honored, you know, and, and uh, I, I'm, it's about time that organizations began to look at the, the preciousness of our minds, that we take care of them, that we uh, appreciate them, and develop them in this way. So I thank you very much for inviting me here. <laughs>